Hello everyone, welcome to session 4 of LTech 651. This week, we're all about producing interactive multimedia. But before we get into that, there is something I wanted to address. And it's this question right here. Are multimedia design principles universal? Well, the answer to this is yes and no. The answer is yes in terms of all learners being viewed as having dual processing channels with a limited capacity in working memory, as well as being active processors of information. In other words, in terms of our human cognitive architecture, we're all the same. However, despite those universal cognitive characteristics, learners differ in a number of important ways. How do they differ? Well, humans can differ in terms of their working memory capacity. Some people have more working memory capacity than others. On average, though, folks can hold about four to seven chunks of information. People also differ in their cognitive and metacognitive strategies. And those are the tools learners use to engage in generative and essential processing. And over time, some people have developed more effective cognitive or metacognitive cognitive strategies. And the other really big differentiating factor is prior knowledge. Familiarity with the topic helps learners handle extraneous processing, and it can guide their essential and generative processing. So you wouldn't treat the novice the same way that you would treat an expert because their level of prior knowledge is different. So I wanted to walk through those elements, those kind of characteristics that can differentiate people to simply point out that the multimedia design principles that we've been studying aren't necessarily applicable to everyone. In fact, most of those principles are best suited for beginners or intermediates, and they aren't as effective for experts. So something to keep in mind as we're thinking about these design principles. Okay, with that in mind, I want to transition now to talking about production. And of course, this week we learned about some e-learning or multimedia authoring tools that are out there. And what did we learn about these? Well, we learned that authoring tools are software for creating and arranging content or media into a standardized structure so that it can be exported and shared in different ways. Now, I want you to think about multimedia authoring tools as falling along a continuum. So on one side of that continuum, we have dedicated design and development tools. And these are tools that are super flexible. You can build things in kind of a piecemeal approach, but they require specific and varied expertise, and they are much harder to learn. The trade-off, of course, is that you can build just about anything that you could imagine, from complex video games and simulations to just your basic interactive presentation. The dedicated design and development tools will allow you to produce any type of interactive multimedia. Now, on the other side, we have integrated design and development tools. And these are tools that are built to be authoring tools for multimedia, but they're less flexible. They're less flexible because they're trying to create this kind of all-in-one approach. They're trying to give you everything that you need to be successful in authoring some simple interactive multimedia. You could think of these as kind of do-it-yourself packages or jack-of-all-trades packages. And the advantage to these is because you have everything in one tool or one environment, they're easier to learn. The downside is they're less customizable, they're less flexible, and so creating something very specific for a certain type of content in a specific target audience, you may not be able to create that in the way that you want. And so what we could see here in terms of this authoring tool continuum is there's a flexibility usability trade-off. As the flexibility of the system increases, the usability of the system decreases. In other words, it gets harder to use. And so depending on where you want to be on this continuum and the technical skills that you have, that's going to determine what set of tools that you will look at. Now, in a college of education, of course, most students are only going to take a course or two related to multimedia development, so we're not expecting you to become experts. 
Because of that, we want to look at some tools that are a little bit easier to use, more off-the-shelf products. So with that in mind, I want to talk to you about H5P. Now, H5P stands for HTML5, the, the latest protocol for HTML, and it stands for HTML5 package. And this is a free and open source content collaboration framework that's based on JavaScript. And the aim of the H5P project is to make it easy to create, share, and reuse interactive HTML5 content. In other words, it's really for making interactive multimedia that's really easy to share and use on the web. Now, we're going to be learning about H5P this week, and I want to make a distinction between H5P.org and H5P.com. H5P.org is the organization organization that is charged with developing this free and open source content collaboration framework. And because it's free and open source, developers from around the world are working on this and contributing to this environment. And I want to encourage you to go to h5p.org and experiment with the different examples and read the documentation related to H5P. Now, importantly, because H5P is HTML5, it's made for the web. And that means that anything that's created with H5P needs to be hosted somewhere on a server. Now, because of that, H5P.org is where all of this content is developed. It's not made for hosting the world's H5P content that people develop. And that's where H5P.com comes into play. So you can see in the title there, it says H5P as a service. H5P.com is offering the H5P software, this content collaboration framework as a service. In other words, you can pay some money to h5p.com in order for them to host and serve the interactive HTML5 content that you develop based on h5p. So there's really two parts to it. There's the group that's creating this collaboration framework and all of its tools, and then there's another group you can pay to host it. Now, of course, if you run your own server or know someone who does, you do not have to pay to use H5P as a service. And, and we'll talk more about that in just a couple of minutes. So what types of content can you create with H5P? Well, it's constantly changing, but here is a sampling of some of the interactive content you can create. You can create accordions. You can create quizzes. You can create images with hotspots. You can create branching scenarios, interactive timelines, so on and so forth. And we'll be looking at some of these examples up close in just a minute. Now, this is an example of one type of H5P content. It's called a course presentation. And let's take a look at the pieces of this course presentation. So here, highlighted in green, is the main view of the course presentation. And you can see here, just like any presentation software, that it actually has text. Some of the text has bullets and some of its title text. And then, of course, it also has an image. And then it says you can jump to the red current. So it also has links and hotspots in it. If we look down below that with this area highlighted in green, you can see here there are 10 slides in this course presentation. If I was to click on any of those, I could jump to that slide. The slides with the circle on them indicate that there's some sort of interactive component that the user needs to interact with. And then down below that, we can see that we're on the first slide, one of 10, and that happens to be named Cloudberries. I can also expand this presentation to make it go full screen, and I could even print this presentation if I wanted to. Now, down at the very bottom of this section, you can see a couple of important things here. Let's read this from left to right. So you can see there is a reuse icon, and if you were to click that, that would allow you to download the code related to this course presentation, and you could remix it and redo it and upload it somewhere else. 
So part of H5P is to make reusable, shareable content. That's part of the open source mindset. As authors of H5P, we can also set the rights or the copyright protection. And we'll take a look at some of the options related to that. And then most importantly, take a look at the third item, which says embed. And what's important about H5P is it's designed to be embedded in other web pages. And that could be a WordPress web page. It could be a web page on your own personal website. It could be a web page in Canvas or in Moodle or in Laulima. And so all this content is designed to work with internet technologies and seamlessly embed. And that's the power of the H5P interactive content. And we'll be taking a look at that in a couple of minutes. I did want to point out that there is a tool called Lumi, and you can find it at lumi.education. And this is actually a standalone H5P content editor, and it's available cross-platform for Windows, Mac, and Linux. So you might want to check this out. And the idea is you run some software locally on your computer that allows you to create H5P content and edit it. Keep in mind, though, however, that once you edit that content and you finalize it, you need to export it as HTML and then upload it to a server somewhere. Because remember, because it's HTML content, it needs to be on a web server somewhere in order for other people to be able to interact with it and access it. Okay, now fortunately, we have at the College of Education, we have our own copy of H5P hosted on a college-wide server. And so you can see here, this is H5P and it's embedded in a WordPress installation. In this week's hands-on tutorial, I'll be showing you how to log in to H5P hosted by the College of Education, and we're actually going to build some content using this interface. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.